Well, I am thrilled to be here, and I am so impressed that your chapter meets every month and does so many things, including having programs. So let's let's see how this how this does right here. Perfect. So um, it looks like, according to today's program, that I am I am down here to talk about um, getting the pay you deserve. And so I was, you know, wondering what what it made sense for me to talk about. And um, so first of all, this 59 cent button, um, I think many of you have been around long enough to know that back in the 80s, um, women earned 59 cents to the dollar that men earned. So we actually have made some progress, because today nationally it's about 79 cents. Um, but still, you know, and then in Massachusetts, it's, it's been hovering between 80, 81, or 82 cents. And so one of the people who was, who was with me back when we were actually um, looking at how to amend our state equal pay law, um, this is a woman who does a lot of salary negotiations, and she was a, a board member of MassNow. She said, OK, how can we explain the gender wage gap? What does it mean to earn, eight, earn 80 cents to every dollar men mean? Well, maybe it's pay gap Fridays. It means that you get paid from Monday through Thursday, but you don't get paid on Friday, right? I mean, that's 80%. So one way to look at it. Um, and so, so back when I was in law school, I did a lot of um, volunteering for the National Now organization. And that's when it was sort of the 59 cents. So um, I am an employment attorney. As Carol said, 20 years ago, I started my own firm in Boston. And I do represent a lot of women in all kinds of issues in the workplace. So it's sexual harassment, sex discrimination, glass ceiling, pregnancy. Oh my gosh. Yes, I have a client who said when she was being laid off a month before she was due. And her boss said, no, 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 this is a good thing because you're going to have more time to spend with your baby. OK, and she was the ma major bread earner of her family. Right, anyway. Um, all kinds of things, including wage discrimination. So that's one of them. And in, in my practice of over 30 years, um, what I've seen is that women at all, all ages, all levels, whatever it is, that women tend not to ask for a raise or more money. Um, more compensation in the same way that men do, and and it's it's just it's 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 everywhere, and I think it's cultural. It, you know, it starts with how you know women. You know, you start in in the classroom. You've got to you know raise your hand, wait until you're going to be called on, right? And then, but the you know the boys get to shout it out, and hey, that's great. But no, you didn't raise your hand, so you know. And then you end up sort of not push, not being aggressive, right? And women are very good at negotiating for other people. And, and, and being there for other people, but not so much for themselves. Anyway, so in my, pra my practice, what I saw is that our state equal pay law was not a good tool for a lot of reasons that I don't have to go into a Supreme Judicial Court decision that just kind of gutted it. And so in 2014, um, a friend of mine and I formed the Pay Equity Task Force of the Women's Bar Association. And we talked to Evelyn Murphy, who was our former first woman lieutenant governor. And Evelyn is wonderful. She now she's an economist, and she runs what is called the Wage um, Project. And we said to, to, we were talking to Evelyn about you know what can we do about you know about the gender wage gap and, and you know it's been stuck and, it, and it's been stuck for about 20 years. It was going up for a while and it got stuck in the 90s and 2000s. And Evelyn said what we need is a comprehensive approach. We don't need this bill that's been hanging out in the legislature going nowhere. We need a comprehensive approach. So this, my co-chair and I sat down and we thought, OK, you know, what do we need? If you look at, went into the legislature and you talked to them about this bill that was getting nowhere, they would say, well, how does that bill, how's that bill going to end the wage gap? I thought, hmm, I don't know. How is it going to end the wage gap? So we thought about what kind of tools do we need to actually end the wage gap? And so we looked at other states statutes and regulations, and we came up with, with an idea, of, with a number of ideas. One idea is that, that I found in my practice, people would come into my office and they would say, um, I didn't get a promotion, or you know, I feel like I'm being pushed out, or I'm not being 
um, I, whatever it is. Um, I, I was just, oh, I had a client who was told she needed coaching to learn how to be assertive instead of aggressive. Okay, only, only female bank vice president, and she was the only one who was too aggressive. Do you think so? Do you think there weren't any men who maybe were? Anyway, so, and then they thought, you know, I think I'm maybe not being paid as much as my, my male peers, but I don't know because compensation is confidential. So how are you going to find out if you're being underpaid to ask for a raise if it's confidential? So confidentiality was one problem. And so we drafted pay transparency language that we saw in other state statutes. And believe me, it doesn't do everything it, we would like. It doesn't require employers to t say what people are earning, but it at least ends the confidentiality policies. You can no longer now under the new law, which went into effect in July, you cannot be penalized if you ask your coworker, how much do you make? and if you talk about your wages for anybody. So that's one, that actually makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at law firms, I can remember being at a law firm where, you know, they hand out the bonuses, don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so you're not gonna tell anybody. So how do you know what bonus that other, you know, mm -hmm. the guy made? So that's one thing. Another thing that we did is, um, well, I extended, I said we really need to extend our statute of limitations because we didn't have enough time to go and file a lawsuit and get back pay, that, that's a different, that's an, another issue, very good issues in terms of, of the problems of, do you, you guys have heard of Lily Ledbetter? Oh, yeah. Okay. Our, our yeah, Lily Led, <laughs> well, Lily Ledbetter, who was a, a manager at Goodyear, and she got that anonymous note that told her it had, it had the list of salaries, including hers, and it was her male coworkers. But it was too late because it had happened so long ago. The Supreme Court said, sorry, you're out of time. That happened you know, years ago. So one of the things our new state statute has is Lily Ledbetter provisions that helps you not miss your statute of limitations. Important tool. So another thing we did, first in the country, and this came from Katie Donovan, the person who, um, who said pay gap, pay gap Fridays, right? Katie Donovan, who she helps women negotiate salaries, she said, you know, in my profession, helping women negotiate, she said, one of the problems is that there is a rule of thumb that if you come into an interview and you're interviewing for a job and they say, Ginny, um, so what do you make? And if you tell them what you make, you say, you know, I make $75,000. They'll add 10% and they will say, okay, add 10%. You know, this is what we're going to offer you. So why should a job be based on the salary you made somewhere else? You know, in some other job that has nothing to do with these job duties or their budget. So Katie Donovan, she said, we need to, we need to restrict questions about salary history and hiring. And that was the most controversial provision that got into the bill. But we got it in, and Massachusetts was the first state in the country to say that if you are in a job interview, an employer, when you're talking about your job, is not allowed to ask you, what, is your, what are you making now, and what is your salary history? And they cannot do it until they have made you a job offer with compensation. So they have to be the first one to make the offer of, and, and as you may know, this is one of the things that we teach in the salary negotiation workshops, which AUW does, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. It's all about who makes the first offer, right? Who's going to name that first number? So they can't say, you know, because what happens with salary history is it can perpetuate past discriminatory wages. And you know what? This doesn't just affect women. It affects women for sure, because women's wages tend to be lower. It affects minorities. But you know what else? It also affects older, older employees. And this was one of the ways that when I was advocating for this, this, um, this bill in the legislature, because, I mean, nobody wanted to touch this salary history. What do you mean? That's the only way we're going to find out what our competitors make. We need the market information. Uh, I mean, they were just, how can this be? So I said to one, it was the, um, the House Chair of the Labor and Workforce Development Committee, which is where the bill went after it was filed, John Seibeck. Um, we were saying to him, and I said, you know, John, um, um, or I might call him Rep Seibeck. I said, you know, Representative Seibeck, um, this can also help older Americans. This is, this is gender neutral. It's not just for women. I said, for example, I have clients who lose their job at the age of 61 or 62 or 65. 
And then they go and try to get another job and are told, no, 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 you don't want this job because your salary is too high. Your salary requirements are too high. And he said, that happened to me. He said, I, I was told I couldn't get a job because they thought my salary was too high. And that was actually one way that we connected with some of the people in the state house who could say, oh, you know, I mean, it is still, you know, at least what? Mm, I think with the election of the new women now, we're up to 28.5% women in our, in our legislature. So you've got 75% men. Um, that was one way that we connected. So Massachusetts is now, as the first state to, to, to impose these restrictions in salary history and the hiring, now there are 11 states across the country and a lot of municipalities who have now included that. And as you get more and more companies to include it, First of all, it starts, what we're doing with this is changing behavior, right? That's what you have to do. You have to change behavior. And as more and more states do it, and more and more large employers think, oh, OK, I've got offices in Massachusetts, and now California's doing it, and so is New York. I'm just going to do it across the country so that our hiring practices are standard. And then lo and behold, that can spill over into Iowa or Missouri or whatever. So that was another tool that, that we put into the bill. Another tool that was put into the bill as a way to impose some best practices and try to um, encourage employers to do the right thing is, and this came out, we found this in the Maine regulations. No state had done this other than Maine by regulation, which is to say to an employer, if you do a self-evaluation of your, of your pay practices, and you do an audit, and you find out that there are gender disparities in wages. And if you take reasonable steps to end those gender disparities yourself, you will get a defense in case someone brings a claim against you. And that was a way that we got businesses on board, like the Chamber of Commerce, and then some of these other people in the State House. And now there are a lot of employers that are doing that. And look at your own practices. And then if you, if you end them and you start you know, giving raises, that's a good thing. So that's also change in behavior. So these are some of the tools that, that, that we got in the bill. And the bill passed in, um, was signed into law August of 2016. It, they gave it two years to go into effect, particularly for these self-evaluations. It went into effect on July 1st of this year. And um, so one of the things that now um, we, so, at, so I did that as a co-chair of the Women's Bar Association. And then the, um, the chair of the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women, we were sitting in the, in the, uh, the gallery of the house while they were um, debating the bill. And she said to me, and I had, I had gotten her in as a, as a um, witness, and I had gotten a lot of the witnesses and that kind of testimony, did a lot of advocating for the bill. She said, Nina, do you know what the commission does? And I said, well, I don't know exactly what they do. And she said, well, why don't you find out? We would love to have an employment attorney on our commission. So I applied, and I was appointed in December 2016 to the Commission on the Status of Women. And it's a statewide body, has 19 volunteer commissioners. It's supposed to be you know, diverse in terms of geographic and people's backgrounds and ethnic and race and whatnot. And, um, and then I was elected chair two years later in, in July. And so what we do is we, the commission was very involved in the Equal Pay Bill. Our executive director led the Equal Pay Coalition. We do a lot of advocacy. I was up at the State House today, actually met with the speaker um, and other people on, on, from the commission about our legislative prior priorities. I met with a House member who is an employment attorney whom I know. And we were talking about a new bill that we're supporting. And I'm giving him some ideas about combating sexual harassment in the workplace. So we're working on that. Um, and then we then met in the afternoon with a, uh, so that was Ken Gordon, Rep. Ken Gordon. And then I met with Rep. Um, uh, Trisha Far Bou Farley Bouvier from Pittsfield in the afternoon. She's working on a comprehensive bill to address um, sexual assault on college campuses. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that, that we do as a commission, get into these kind of different legislative priorities. So one of the things we're doing now in terms of implementing the Equal Pay Bill, and this we're doing with AAUW, is um, salary negotiation workshops. I don't, has anyone heard about these? Yes. Yeah. In Boston. Right. So, so this is something, first of all, Evelyn Murphy wrote the curriculum for these workshops many years ago, and then gave it to AAUW. So they, um, they have the license. 
And they've been doing these particular, Boston's done like over 7,000 of these workshops through the Mayor's Office of Advancement of, for Women. Um, but so in the last year, um, the, our state treasurer, Deb Goldberg, is taking her Office of Economic Advancement and they have, um, they're working with AAUW, the community colleges, and us, the Commission on the Status of Women, to try to roll these out statewide. Now, it's a big project, let me tell you. Um, but so the treasurer is picking up the cost that you have to pay AAUW for the, each workshop in the curriculum. Um, the community colleges are providing space. Um, we are being trained, our, who, anyone who wants to, it's not required, but any of our, our, our either statewide commissioners, 19 of us, and there are 11 regional commissions. And in fact, Plymouth County just got its regional commission for the first time. Um, they had their inaugural meeting in August. We appoint the regional commissioners. They're having their first hearing in Brockton on November 29th at the War Memorial. Anyone is, everyone is welcome. It's public. People can get up and talk about anything that affects women. We would love to see people at that hearing. Um, so, we, um, so we have over 100 regional commissioners like nine, most, most of our commissions have nine commissioners. So some of them, and, and I have been trained as a facilitator to, we, we learn the curriculum to then go and facilitate these workshops. And there are two different ones. One is geared towards college age and young women. It's called Start Smart. And then old, older women called Work Smart. And it, it's, it's really just to give tools about how, do you, how to negotiate a, a, your salary. And one of the things has to do with, don't be the first, you know, don't be, don't give out that, that, that first offer. You know, what are you going to do if they ask you, so what do you make now? You know, what are you going to say? Uh, you're not allowed to ask that question now because it's against the law. Mm, maybe that's not going to be endearing, right? But, you know, you have to say something else like, well, um, um, what, what does the, you know, what does the position pay? Or... You can, what you can say is you can tell somebody, this is what I'm looking for. This is what my salary expectations are. That is a good way to try to parry that question, right? And then you can say, well, you know, I'm, I'm, it, I would like to know, I'm assuming that there's a budget and it depends on what the job responsibilities are. Let's talk a little bit more about the job duties. Um, but another thing about this whole thing in terms of, of um, salary negotiation is, Employers think they need that information to know what they're going to pay you or what the market is. But these days, there are so many ways of finding out what the market is. There are, you know, payscale.com and, and Glassdoor, and there are a lot of studies which, you know, and that's information that maybe wasn't available before. But there's a lot of ways that an employer can get that and that, you know, you, individuals when you're going in there or your daughters or your you know whoever might be talking to you about this is go in and, and and do some research and find out you know what what do these jobs pay you know before you go in there and so i was doing a um i was giving a talk i wasn't doing a workshop but i was giving a talk about this in january to a um an organization called ladies get paid and they're across the country it's mostly young women kind of 20s and 30s and 40s you know, and then they invited me, um, even though I'm not a young woman, but I was there with my daughter, um, who's 20, let's see, what is she, she's 25. She works for a Boston City Councilor, and she's now, and she came in this to, to my office this summer. Her office is right next to my office, because my office is on City Hall Plaza, and she said, Mom, you would be so proud of me. I asked for a promotion, and I asked for a raise. Awesome. Like, Caroline, awesome, right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so I was giving this talk at this Ladies Get Paid um, event. We were talking about salary. What do you do? How do you negotiate? I mean, nobody teaches you these things. So one woman said, um, you know, raised her hand, of course, because we're women, we raise our hand. Um, and she said, well, I, what I want to know is, how do you talk about getting a raise without your boss thinking you're too assertive or too aggressive, too without it being negative, because this is something that on the whole, women do get penalized when they do this, and, and, when, and men generally don't. So, it, I mean, that, it's a conundrum. 
And she said, and so we asked her, tell us about your experience. Well, I went in there and I, I was all ready and I had my arguments. You know, why? You know, you've, it's got to be a good time. Um, it was my annual review and I thought, you know, I, I got a good review, so I thought I could ask for a raise. And he was really surprised. Well, I'm really surprised you're, you know, you're asking for that money. And so she felt, she felt like she was getting that pushback. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we said to her, I said, well, okay, so were you successful? And she said, yes. Ultimately, she was. And she said, so would you do it again? And she said, she was. I mean, it was, might have been uncomfortable, but she was successful. She might not have gotten the raise she asked for, but she did get a raise. So if you don't ask, you're not going to get it, right? You know, and I mean, there's a lot. I'm not going to give a salary negotiation workshop today, but there's a lot of really interesting things. But anyway, that is one of the things that we at the commission are doing in terms of how do, how do you implement this new law, right? How are we ever going to close that gender wage gap unless people go in and actually ask to be paid fairly, ask, you know, to be, you know, ask for a raise. So um, anyway, those are some of the things we're doing. Um, I don't know whether I, I, I don't know really what you guys want to know about. Should I, do people have questions? Do people want to know what more about things the commission is doing or? What exactly? So um, as Carol said, the commission was started in 1998. And um, it started after um, the 1995 conference uh, on women in Beijing, where Hillary Clinton spoke about you know, women's rights or human rights. Um, so at that conference, at, at that time, um, Bill Weld was our governor, and Susan Weld was the first lady. And she attended the conference on women in Beijing. This was a whole, you know, global conference. And one of the things that came out of that conference was that they uh, that it was important to have commissions or agencies or something around the world focused on women's issues. And and particularly here in the United States, there were I'm not exactly sure what the, the status was, but Massachusetts didn't have anything. And so Susan Weld came back to Massachusetts and said we're going to have a commission on women here in Massachusetts and got really sort of, so it was Governor Weld and Susan Weld were working with him that got that legislation to form the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. And so there are now commissions, I think, in every state, um, although they're all different. Um, some of them are appointed by the governor, so they change with the governor. Ours is an independent commission. And there are 19 volunteer commissioners. Um, and we are appointed by four appointing authorities. So, and it's going to be, some of them is, is I, I don't know if this is going to add up to 19, but let's just go with it. Um, I think maybe the governor has five um, appointees. The Speaker of the House has maybe four. The Senate president maybe has four. And the Caucus of Women Legislatures has six. I don't know if that adds up to, whatever it is, that adds up to 19. And it was important. Um, you know, back in the day, not even back in the day, today, how many governors, speakers of the House, and Senate presidents are men, right? So if it was just those, we would have men appointing women. So to also add the caucus of women legislators, and they have the more, most appointees, and those are all of the women legislators that are women senators and are women House reps form the caucus of women legislators. So that's our appointing authorities. And we have three-year terms that are staggered. And what we do is our mission is to enhance opportunities for women and girls in the Commonwealth to be an effective voice for women and girls. And there are a lot of ways that we do that. And one of the things that we do is these public hearings that we hold for a year. And as I said, the next one is in Brockton. So that's not far from here. Um, we held our first one in Turner's Falls, which is right near Greenfield, really cute little town there, um, at the Shea Theater. It's a beautiful theater. And we, um, um, let me see, then our third one's going to be in Malden, because that's one of our new regional commissions, Upper Middlesex. And our fourth one in April, um, so we're going to have one in November, then we're going to, we decided to skip January and February because no, of the yes, weather. No. That, was a, that was a vote we took. <laughs> Everyone agreed. Um, so we have March is Malden, and then April is going to be in Dorchester. Um, those are going to be our public hearings. And they're t open to the public. Anyone can come and speak about any issue that affects women. And it's incredible the kind of things that we hear. 
And taking this information, it helps us to understand what are the issues affecting women across the state. It helps inform our legislative priorities. Um, we take everyone's testimony and it goes in our annual report that we give to, the, to our appointing authorities, the governor, the Senate president, the Speaker of the House, and the caucus, um, which is up on our website. And it really helps us also think about, you know, what are those issues that are important to women? And it's interesting how many are common. You know, I mean, food insecurity, homelessness, homeless elderly, elder women, homelessness, um, drug issues, taking care of, of adults with disabilities, you know, you know, with, with, with autism and, and um, um, issues of public transportation everywhere, especially in rural Massachusetts domestic violence and, and how there are circles. You know, if you're out in the rural part of the state and you're in a domestic violence situation and you don't have you don't have a place to go because, well, who's got the purse strings? And so then there's maybe a, a homeless family and maybe you don't have a car, but there's no public transportation, so you're stuck, right? And so the public hearings are um, fascinating. And we had, um, at our last public hearing, we had three Girl Scouts who testified, who stood up. One was 12 years old, one was 15, and one was in high school, probably 16 or 17. So articulate. You know, and one of them was talking about, I think it was a 12-year-old, talking about how um, she was the head of her math club. OK, first of all, good for her. But she got a lot of pressure. She was getting pressure not to speak out and not to be bossy. And she said that her younger sister, who was in third grade, um, was just told that they played kickball during recess and that the boys didn't want her on the kickball like team. And so these gender stereotypes, right? And, and, and I mean, they start so young. So anyway, it was fascinating. So, so we have these four public hearings a year and get a lot of information. Um, and then another thing that we do is um, we have a legislative and public policy committee where we think about what are, you know, what are the issues that we should prioritize. We help draft legislation. We support legislation. We go, like today, I mean, I talked with two representatives just about, about how we can support and work with those kind of legislative priorities. Um, we reach out through our regional commissions to, you know, when there's a bill that we're trying to get through and we need people to write letters, write emails, you know, show up. Any of you could do that, you know, through your, the Plymouth Commission or just going on our website. Once a year, we have Advocacy Day, where we get 250, 300, 350 um, women at the State House to meet with your state reps. And we hear from, we have a lot of speakers. Um, we have lunch, and then we go and, and have whole, like a whole list of people to go meet with and talk about legislative priorities. And we've had some of our regional commissions, like from Bristol and other places, have also brought bus, bus loads of girls from our high school. And we think that because of that interest, so much interest, we're going to maybe have two different advocacy days, one that can be just focused on girls and bringing them. And so that's a wonderful way of getting people to the State House. Um, we have another program called Unsung Heroines, which last year we had, I think, 220 women across the state who get nominated by either a senator or a state rep who have worked in their communities and just done wonderful work. And we're just recognizing them and bringing them to the state house. And their rep or their senator is there. And we read off every single person's name and a little bit about what they do. And it's just, it's amazing. But isn't it nice to be recognized mm -hmm. you know, for just something that you're doing? So that's another thing yeah. that we do. Um, so, well, there you go. Right. OK, Jane. Jane, maybe your state rep might say, look, a founding member of AAUW. I mean, there you go. I mean, we had two, two young women who were on a college campus and had started some kind of a Me Too sort of a group on their college campus. So they were nominated by their state rep, and they came up here. And we had two older women from a community who have been working through their church, and I don't know what, for just decades on wonderful things. I can't remember what wonderful things, but anyway, it's a great, it's a great thing. Um, so, and then our regional commissions just do incredible work. Um, and it's up to them, but they're very close with their community. I just heard today from Rep um, Farley Bouvier that the Berkshire Commission on the Status of, of Women 
is going to focus all their energy this year on women in the correctional institutions. That's going to be their whole focus, wow. right? Um, so, you know, and we've got other ones that are really focusing on, on uh, you know, gun violence or other ones that want to bring um, lecturers or bring, like, movies just to, to show them. Um, I mean, in Worcester, they've done a lot of work on opiates. Um, I know out in Springfield, one of the things, sex trafficking is an issue that one of those regional commissions um, has really looked at. So it's just, so it's, that's, that's, so the commission's doing Amazing. a lot of work, especially at the regional level. And Plymouth is brand new, and we're just waiting for people to get involved. I mean, if, if it's, it's one of those things that it really is, it can be anything that you want to have it become, right? If you're willing to put, like what you guys are doing. You guys bring in people to come and speak and, and you get together and you've got that sort of a will to how do we bring women together and, 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 and do something. So this is a way to affect maybe policy on a local level through the regional commissions, but also try to do something on the statewide level. because. Isn't that where things are happening these days? It's got to be on the statewide level. So, yeah. So anyway, that that's what that can give you a little bit about what the Commission on the Status of Women does. Yeah. So, questions? Anyone want to talk about something? 1995 is when the the Beijing Conference. I think our legislation was 98 is when it got passed. So 20 years, in fact, this are 20 years. Not much. That's why we had to pass this bill. Nothing. The Supreme Judicial Court decision that gutted our state law was in 1998. And nothing happened. And the new law that we got through the legislature only went into effect on July 1st. So, so we're hoping that we're going to see something. So, but you know, that, that, that's going to take some time. But some of the other things that have happened, like this year, actually, this legislative session was a really good one for women, actually. Um, so paid family medical leave, that got passed. What does that make us, the fifth state, maybe? Now, it's going to take three years before it goes into effect. I mean, we need regulations. I mean, this is a big, big deal. So it's going to take a little while. But, but that, that got passed, and that was a heavy lift. The Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. That is a new law that got passed this year, and one of our commissioners did a lot of work to get that done. She started a group called um, Mother Woman and really worked on this. And so, okay, first of all, why do you need Pregnant Workers Fairness Act? I mean, why can't people just treat pregnant women fairly? No, oh my gosh. And so this law just got passed in Massachusetts. And I mean, the testimony was just heartbreaking about women who, you know, worked in a laundry and who was pregnant and, you know, just wanted to have a lifting, the, her doctor said, a lifting restriction because of all of the heavy, heavy laundry, um, you know, barrels and things that they lifted. But if you don't have, if your pregnancy is not a disability, it didn't cause a disability, most pregnancies don't cause a disability, the law didn't require the employer to give her light duty. So we had to pass a statute that said even a normal pregnancy, if the doctor says, you know, you, you need that, and this woman t who testified had had at least one miscarriage um, because of, 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 of this. I had a client who had a miscarriage, I won't even go into what it was, at, at work um, when she had to do all this horrible cleaning with chemicals and things. Um, so the Pregnant Women's Fairness Act also says, you know, if you just need a chair, you know, I just need to sit down. If you don't have a disability, the law didn't require an employer to give you the chair, right? Or I, I need to take, I need frequent bathroom breaks. I need a bottle of water at work. So anyway, that law got passed this year. Um, another law that, that was passed this year is, um, or we had to do a law to, repeal some archaic laws. We still had laws on, on the books um, in terms of um, contraception and, I mean, like really, really old ones that, that we were worried when, with the Trump administration, maybe rolling back some of the protections for, um, 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 you know, in terms of health insurance coverage. That was a, a bill that got passed this year, which is the, um, the access bill 
so that we can still require <laughs> insurance coverage for just contraceptives, because look what's happening on the federal level. Um, so anyway, there were, there were actually were a lot of, of, of laws that have been passed this year. And now I'm hoping next year we've got some more women elected. Um, you know, we're certainly going to be working on um, sexual harassment and sexual assault on campus. But here's another interesting thing that we're working on that almost got passed this year. Um, but we're hoping we can maybe get it through early. So in Massachusetts, if you are running for office, um, you are allowed to use campaign funds for things like um, maybe a, a bus ticket to go attend a campaign event, or um, maybe you've got you've got food that you have to pay. You know, you've got to feed your campaign staff for a campaign event. And if you are a man and you wear a tuxedo to a campaign event, you can get that dry cleaned with campaign funds, but you cannot pay for childcare for a campaign-related event. No, 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 no. That's personal. So this year, um, we, um, we were, this is one of the bills that we've been actively supporting, meaning we were, we're like the primary advocates working with the sponsors of the bill, just to say, OK, you know what? And this is gender neutral. Anyone who runs for office, if you need child care, to attend a campaign-related event, you should be able to take that out of your campaign funds. We were just talking to a, a guy who, um, he was running for office, and my, our legislative committee chair said he was running for office here in Massachusetts, and he had young kids. He had a six-year-old. So his parents drove from Ohio to Massachusetts on the weekends to take care of his kids because he, he, he couldn't pay for you know, childcare out of it. So anyway, that's one thing that would be a, a, a I mean, it benefits everybody, but childcare tends to fall on women. And if you think about it, you know, back in the day, most of the people running for office were men and their wives took care of the kids. Mm -hmm. Wasn't even an issue. So anyway, so that's something right. that we're working on. And you know, that's just one a little barrier. And on the federal level, you can, they, the FEC just clarified this year you can use campaign funds on the federal level for child care related campaign events. So in Texas, Wisconsin, and Alabama have it in their laws. So maybe Massachusetts should follow wow. Texas, Wisconsin, and Alabama. Yeah. OK? Yeah. So anyway, and if you think that's a good thing, you know what? When that comes around, um, I mean, we have information on our website about the bills that we're following, and the, and the Plymouth Commission may end up having information on the bills. And we'll reach out to people to say, please, go and email you. Call your own state reps. The, and they listen, believe me. I mean, you guys will probably do it. You're AAUW. You probably do that anyway. But I can tell you, they do. They really listen to their constituents. And they really look at their emails. And they look at the counts. And they know, you know who's out there. So that, that's something anybody can do. Everybody can do. Very interesting. You know what? It, it, it does. It's so important. I mean, and those are the kind of things that will make a difference over time. I mean, they really will make a difference over time. I mean, I'd love to see, you know, women students. Um, and we had, um, I'm trying to think, at our advocacy day, there was a woman, a young woman who was there. So she was a college student, and she attended our advocacy day. And I was just talking to her. I said, well, where do you go to college? California. And she was there because she was doing some kind of an internship and that was related to government. And I'm thinking, oh, how wonderful to have young people just be aware of what is going on you know, in the government. Government matters. Wake up. Have a role in your government, right? <laughs> Still, I have to say, it's hard, hard, still hard to know. Um, so, in um, you know, public institutions have to have to everything's public. So, you know, if if you're in the government, you know what the pay is, and the pay tends to be fairer because of that. I mean, so we don't have that kind of transparency yet here, you know, in Massachusetts or in the United States. Um, there are there are some organizations that have been really out in front on pay. 
Um, Salesforce.com, for example, they did their own sort of, you know, their own audit and, and came out um, in, in favor of, of, um, of, of increasing wages. Um, I think actually Google, which has gotten a bad rap on sort of sexual harassment, mm, yeah. um, but actually was, you know, much better on pay. I think that some of the some of the some of the companies that tend to try to really hire more of the younger workers, I think, are we're going to see better on pay issues because younger workers are more likely to say, "Well, wait a minute. Well, they, first of all, so much of the information they've grown up with such so much information mm -hmm. that it's like, well, why shouldn't I know what that person's making?" Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a place where we might see more um, changes because maybe we'll see more younger people demanding that because that information should be out there. Um, so I, I, still, I still think it's hard to know what some of the, the, the sort of the good um, organizations, but I have to say the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce was a real leader on pay equity and made a big difference in that law getting passed. And in 2015, the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce um, had a, got a new executive director, Jim Rooney, I think his name is. And he decided that he was going to stick his neck out and have the Chamber of Commerce really support the changes to, to the law. And that was something that, that really took, like he, he was a real leader in the business community to do that. And I talked with their legislative director as we were advocating for it. And what she said is that they surveyed, you know, all their members and a confidential survey and, of course, lots of women who work at these companies and, um, and felt that this is something that they needed to do. And so when you have the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce saying this is important, that then can filter down to some of the companies there. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see how many of them do these, these pay audits and do self-evaluations and, and change their pay practices. Um, but I think it, it's kind of too early to tell still what's going to happen with the law. So it's in May. I might actually know. I might know when it is. Wait a minute. I have my calendar with me. I do actually still use paper. Yeah. I mean, my gosh. OK, calendar, look at this. All right, let's see. Let's see whether we've we may, we may not have chosen it yet, though. Advocacy Day, Wednesday, May 15th, 2019, from 9 to 1 at the State House. Look at that. Advocacy Day. And we would love to have people come. Um, and I mean, our, our like the Plymouth Commission will certainly, they'll have it on their website. We'll have it on our website, and it's it's a, it's just it's a great day, um, and you get to meet your state reps and other people, and meet other you know people, and talk about different bills. So November 29th, um, 4:30 from 4:30 to 6:30 at the War Memorial in Brockton is the um, and we'd love to have people come and bring a friend and 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 testify get up and speak out about something that's important to you what, whatever it is it's it's I mean it really and we take all that and we also take written testimony and all of it um, ends up on in our annual report too did you have something you want to ask I'm not I'm not sure there may be. Um, I think in Boston, I know that Boston has done that. And there is a report. Actually, you know what? I believe um, UMass Boston Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy just came out with a report. And in fact, I was, I was on a panel with Ann Bookman the other day, who, who is the director of the, um, of, of the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy. They just did a report, and they found something like 50% of the women who had taken these workshops got raises, something that I was astonished. I'm thinking, now, I don't know what data. <laughs> yeah. I have not yet seen the report. But very, I mean, really promising. And I do believe that um, the Mayor's Office of Women in Boston, which has been doing these for a long time, 
and also the Boston Women's Workforce Council, they are actively really following this and I think are, are collecting some of that follow-up data. Yeah. Anyone interested in facilitating these workshops? You know, you can do it through, I mean, we're, we're, it, it's, it takes a while to roll it out. Um, but I did say when, when, I, um, when the Plymouth Commission had their first meeting in August, I said to them, if anybody wants to do this, please just, you can sign up to, to do the facilitator training and do a workshop. And, you know, it's, it's a tool. It's something. But see, what we're doing is through the treasurer's office that's doing it with the community colleges. So that's, and that's actually not geared towards college students. That's just the place we're having it for, you know, anyone who wants to show up. Anyone. I mean, it can be men, too. I mean, this is, right? This is not like we can't say you can't. Anybody can learn to negotiate. But yes, a lot of colleges have already been doing that. Tufts, UMass, uh, and, and it's, um, I, I think it's great. I mean, I wish I'd known that when I was in college. I got fired when I was pregnant. <laughs> you needed a good attorney, and it oh, still I happens. I got fixed the year I got fixed. Somebody else did go to an attorney, and that's how Yes. Yeah. Oh, were you part of that early? Early, yeah. There were, I mean, there were some very, very early pregnancy discrimination um, yeah, through, through was teachers. Was in like 1968 oh. or something. Oh, yeah, interesting. They did win the case, so right, 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 right. Nor can anyone else. <laughs> well, at least it's illegal. Doesn't mean that it doesn't yet still happen. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, Pregnancy yeah. discrimination is rampant. Just saying. It's very sad. Anyone else? No? Okay, well, great. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Good. I don't get to wear my 59 cent button very often, so that's fun. Anyway, one in five women target of sexual assault in college. That's so true. We're working on that issue. We are. Well, thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you that was really lots of fun.